OnLive was a Mountain View, California based provider of cloud virtualization technologies. OnLive's flagship product was its cloud gaming service, which allowed subscribers to rent or demo computer games without installing them on their device. Games were delivered to OnLive's client software as streaming video rendered by the service's servers, rather than rendered locally by the device. This setup allowed the games to run on computers and devices that would normally be unable to run them due to insufficient hardware, and also enabled other features, such as the ability for players to record gameplay and to spectate. The service was available through clients for personal computers and mobile devices, as well as through smart TVs and a dedicated video game console-styled device known as the OnLive Game System. OnLive also expanded into the cloud desktop market with a sister product, OnLive Desktop, a subscription service offering a cloud-based instance of Windows Server 2008 R2 accessible via tablets. The OnLive service received mixed reception. Critics noted that the video quality and amount of input lag varied on a game-by-game -game basis, and did not consider OnLive to be a complete substitute to owning games and playing them on local hardware due to these inconsistencies and other factors that prospective users may consider, such as the overall cost of the service as opposed to simply upgrading their existing computers. Critics praised the service for allowing users to demo games without the need to install them, along with its built-in spectator mode. On April 2, 2015, it was announced that Sony Computer Entertainment had acquired OnLive's patents, and that all OnLive services would be discontinued on April 30, 2015. Sony operates PlayStation Now, a similar service built using the infrastructure of Gaikai, a former competitor to OnLive. <laughs> Gaming platform The game service was available via the OnLive game system and a number of different device categories Windows PCs, PCs running Windows XP, Windows Vista, Windows 7, or Windows 8 including Windows 8 with Bing for low-cost devices such as the HP Stream. Apple Macintosh, Intel-based Macs running Mac OS by 10.6 or later. Smartphones, Android smartphones running 3.2 or later. Tablets, Android tablets running 3.2 or later. The OnLive Android Player app was released to the Android market on December 7, 2011. Gaming-centric tablet devices, Wikipad, NVIDIA Shield, and NVIDIA Shield tablet. Android TV, OnLive announced that the OnLive game service will be pre-installed on Philips' new line of Android-based smart TVs. OnLive is also compatible with various Android set-top boxes for TVs Madcats MOJO. Connected TVs, OnLive announced that the OnLive game service will be integrated into new Vizio Via Plus TVs along with LG TVs and Google TV. Internet connected media players, Amazon's Fire TV and Fire TV Stick, Vizio CoStar, and Vizio's line of Via Blu-ray players, a web browser-based demo service was also available for Windows PCs and Intel-based Macs running Mac OS X 10.5.8 or later enabling trials of games to be played without the need to download the OnLive client. The service was also demonstrated on the Apple iPhone, network requirements. The service required a 2 megabits per second internet connection, 5 megabits per second or higher recommended with low latency. OnLive initially required a wired connection. On September 15, 2010, beta Wi-Fi support was made available to all members. Topic: <laughs> OnLive game system. The OnLive game system consisted of an OnLive wireless controller and a console, called the Microconsole TV Adapter, that could be connected to a television and directly to the OnLive service, so it was possible to use the service without a computer. It came with the accessories needed to connect the equipment, and composite video users could purchase an additional optional cable. The Microconsole supported up to four wireless controllers and multiple Bluetooth headsets. It also had two USB ports for game controllers, keyboards, mice, and USB hubs. For video and audio output it provided component, HDMI, TOSLINK ports, and an analog stereo minijack. An Ethernet port was used for network access, which was required to access the OnLive service. Pre-orders for the OnLive game system began to be taken on November 17, 2010.
Topic: <laughs> Playpack flat rate plan. OnLive confirmed the details of its Playpack flat rate payment plan on December 2, 2010. With this option players pay a monthly fee for unlimited access to recent, classic and indie titles in the OnLive library, which includes new releases. Playpack subscribers also receive a 30% off discount toward purchase of OnLive merchandise excluding Playpack membership fees. This discount can be applied to sale items, on live wireless controllers, and the on live game system. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Desktop service. On January 10 at the 2012 Consumer Electronics Show, on live announced on live desktop. OnLive Desktop used desktop virtualization technology to create a remotely hosted Windows Server 2008 desktop environment. On March 12, 2012, Microsoft told OnLive that its OnLive Desktop service was a violation of the Windows 7 license agreement, and threatened legal action, contending that the license agreement did not permit the use of Windows 7 as a hosted client, nor for Office to be provided as a service on Windows 7 since this would be only allowed using Windows Server and Terminal services. On April 7, 2012 it was discovered that the OnLive desktop service had changed and had begun to use Windows Server 2008, bringing it into license compliance. <laughs> <laughs> Architecture In the U.S., OnLive was hosted in five co-located North American data centers. There were facilities in Santa Clara, California and Virginia, with additional facilities in Dallas, Texas, as well as Illinois, and Georgia. OnLive stated that users must be located within 1,000 miles 1, kilometers of one of these to receive high-quality service. The hardware used was a custom setup consisting of OnLive's proprietary video compression chip as well as standard PC CPU and GPU chips. For older, or lower performance, games such as LEGO Batman, multiple instances could be played on each server using virtualization technology. High-end games such as Assassin's Creed II required one GPU per game. Two video streams are created for each game. One the live stream, is optimized for gameplay and real-world internet conditions, while the other the media stream, was a full HD stream that was server-side and used for spectators or for gamers to record videos of their gameplay. International availability The service was launched in the United Kingdom on September 22, 2011 in partnership with British Telecom as a bundled service with their broadband packages. The company planned to make its service available in the rest of Europe as well. History on Live was announced at the Game Developers Conference in 2009. The service was originally planned for release in the winter of 2009. OnLive's original investors include Warner Brothers, Autodesk and Maverick Capital. A later round of financing included AT&T Media Holdings, Inc. and Lauder Partners as well as the original investors. In May 2010, it was announced that British Telecom and Belgacom invested in and partnered with OnLive. On March 10, 2010, OnLive announced the OnLive game service would launch on June 17, 2010, in the US, and the monthly service fee would be $14.95. At launch the membership option available was through AT&T's founding members promotion, which provides the service for free for the first year and $4.95 per month for the optional following year. On October 4, 2010, OnLive announced that there would no longer be any subscription fees for the service. On March 11, 2010, OnLive CEO Steve Perlman announced the OnLive Game Portal, a free way to access OnLive games for rental and demos, but without the social features of the game service. It was stated that it would roll out later in 2010 after the OnLive Game Service launch. The OnLive Game Service was launched in the United States on June 17, 2010. Shortly afterwards, on December 10 OnLive was awarded a patent for cloud gaming the U.S. Patent Office. The service was launched in the United Kingdom on September 22, 2011. On January 10 at the 2012 Consumer Electronics Show, OnLive announced OnLive Desktop. OnLive Desktop used virtualization technology to create a remotely hosted Windows 7 desktop.
Topic: <laughs> Layoffs and buyout. On August 17, 2012, the company laid off all of its employees. OnLive entered into a proceeding known as an assignment for the benefit of creditors, wherein OnLive shareholders lost their stakes in the company. OnLive then sold off its assets and started a new company, also called OnLive. On August 20, 2012, the company officially revealed Lauder Partners as the buyer. On August 27, 2012, founder Steve Perlman stepped down as CEO, Gary Lauder became chairman, and Charlie Yablonski, former VP of Operations, was appointed COO and acting CEO. It was revealed in October of that year that OnLive was sold for only $4.8 million. For a company that analysts once estimated was worth approximately $1.8 billion, there was some surprise at the low figure for which the company was sold. Some analysts speculated that the true value of the patents held by the company was potentially in the hundreds of millions of dollars, but that the firm's poor bargaining position led to the cheap sale. Relaunch In March 2014 the company hired a new CEO, Mark Young and released a new gaming service, Cloudlift. Cloudlift links to selected titles in a player's game library and allows the player resume gameplay on another device. Topic: <laughs> Sale to Sony and shutdown. On April 3, 2015, OnLive announced it had sold most of its assets to Sony Entertainment and would be shutting down all services on April 30, 2015. Reception Pre-launch Soon after the company's announcement at GDC 2009, there was skepticism expressed by game journalists, concerned about how the on-live service might work and what the quality of the service might be both in terms of the hardware required in on-live server centers to render and compress the video, as well as the impact of commercial internet broadband connections on its delivery. During GDC 2009, which was held in San Francisco, the on-live service was 50 miles 80 kilometers from its Santa Clara data center. The closed beta had hundreds of users on the system. Near E3 in 2009, which is approximately 350 miles 560 kilometers away from their data center, OnLive demonstrated their service performed well with a consumer cable modem and internet connection. Matt Peckham from PC World stated in his blog that it might be technically difficult to transfer the amount of data that a high-definition game would require. He stated he believed on-live customers would need a broadband line with guaranteed, non-shared, and interruptible speed. But, broadband isn't there yet, nor are ISPs willing to offer performance guarantees. He also mentioned his concerns that the mod community would be unable to create and offer mods since all game data will be stored on the on-live servers, and that games played on on-live might not be owned. By the user, and thus if OnLive were to go under, all the user's games would be inaccessible. Savat Yerli, the CEO of Crytek, had researched a method for streaming games but concluded that Crytek's approach would not be viable until 2013, at earliest. Yerli made it clear Crytek was not directly involved with the OnLive service, and Yerli had no personal experience using the service. Rather, Electronic Arts, the publisher of Crytek's Crisis Warhead, had partnered with OnLive and had tested and endorsed the OnLive technology. Yearly stated, I want to see it myself. I don't want to say it's either top or flop. I hope it works for them because it could improve gamers' lives. The technology of video-based rendering is not actually a very new concept but they do some things that others didn't do before so it will be interesting to see. Eurogamer's Digital Foundry was amongst the most harshly skeptical in an article published upon OnLive's unveiling and public demonstration entitled, GDC, Why OnLive Can't Possibly Work, by Digital Foundry's Richard Ledbetter. The article's analysis characterized OnLive as a fake demo that was technically impossible to accomplish over a consumer internet connection. Post-launch. 
After the launch of the service in the United States, favorable reviews by game journalists stated that the service performed well, and they looked forward to the service improving over time. Hiawatha Bray of the Boston Globe stated, It felt exactly as if I had installed the software on my local computer. Chris Holt of Macworld, in his review of Assassin's Creed II on OnLive using his Mac, wrote that he looks forward to future higher resolution improvements that are already promised. He never encountered any frame rate issues. And the game is on the whole every bit as immersive, rewarding, and free as the console version. Dan Ackerman of CNET wrote that OnLive was an overall very impressive experience, and several minds around the CNET offices were officially blown, a difficult task among this jaded bunch. In examining latency, Eurogamer's Digital Foundry initial test found that in some of their test scenarios, users of OnLive could expect 150 milliseconds of latency over a consumer internet connection. However, they also noted inconsistencies, in that some games had higher latency, and that this would also depend on the quality of the customer's internet connection. Furthermore, they also noted that while acceptable, these values ran contrary to figures suggested by OnLive before release of lag being under 80 milliseconds, and usually between 35 to 40 milliseconds. In their later full feature article on OnLive, Digital Foundry noted that during intense gameplay, OnLive is hovering right at the boundary of what is acceptable lag and often exceeds it, resulting in a variable, often unsatisfactory experience. But that the latency level is probably the most pleasant surprise with this system. Let's be clear, it is most definitely not a replacement for the local experience, but if the system can be tightened up and that 150 milliseconds becomes the norm, then it's clear there is potential here for the infrastructure to find a home with certain types of game or certain types of player. In terms of video quality, Digital Foundry noted that video compression meant image quality also varied depending on the title. Games with a lower number of frame-to-frame -frame differences, or games where such changes were less important, such as Assassin's Creed II or Batman, Arkham Asylum fared well, with these games being strongly suited to video compression, and cut scenes in particular can look very good. However, games that had a greater amount of motion or relied on fast reactions, such as Colin McRae, Dirt, Dirt 3 or Unreal Tournament 3 fared less well, with questions about the playability of the latter when video compression artifacts were taken into account. Digital Foundry felt that the quality of rendering was mostly good, with high frame rates, but with less consistency than console counterparts and with screen tearing in some scenarios, Gaming Examiner judged that the graphics were like playing a PlayStation 3 on a 480p standard definition TV that they thought that they experienced much lower frame rates than expected and that the controller was not working reliably after the launch in United Kingdom computer and video games remarked that after 1 month of use the service was working and was adequate for trying or renting a game, but that it was not a substitute for owning a game on another platform due to the limitations imposed by internet connections lag, freezing and smeary visuals, as well as high data usage for those on capped connections. See also List of cloud gaming providers